Oude avond, mag er wat doorlopen. Of deze staat klaar. En daarna een plaatje zoeken in het atrium. U heeft kinderen. Ik heb ook kinderen. Vier. En wat wij allemaal willen is dat onze zonen en dochters een goede toekomst tegemoet gaan. Dat ze goed terechtkomen. Daar zijn we mee bezig als ouder vanaf het moment dat ze naar de basisschool gaan en vervolgens naar de middelbare school. En u werd door die scholen bij hun leren en hun keuzes zeer betrokken. Ja en dan. Ik weet het zelf nog heel goed toen mijn oudste dochter 14 jaar geleden naar het hbo ging. De boodschap was eigenlijk, was eigenlijk heel duidelijk, laat los. Ze is 18 jaar, ze staat nu op eigen benen en je hebt als ouder geen bemoeienis meer met haar studie. Ik vond die abrupte overgang toen niet fijn, want je wilt toch betrokken zijn bij de nieuwe wereld van je kind. Sterker nog, wij als Hanse Hogeschool vinden dat dat moet en dat uw betrokkenheid een van de belangrijke factoren is voor studiesucces van uw kind. En daarom organiseert de Hanse Hogeschool in oktober voor alle ouders van alle eerstejaarsstudenten deze avond. Met als doel dat wij u vanavond meenemen in de nieuwe wereld van uw zoon of dochter studeren aan het hbo. Ik begin met u een vraag te stellen. Wie van u weet welke tentamens uw zoon of dochter de komende periode heeft en welke opdrachten af moeten en wanneer? Nou, kom eens op met die vingers. Oké. Okay. En of er gestudeerd wordt voor een zesje of voor een acht. Of er überhaupt gestudeerd wordt. Voor ons is namelijk die eerste tentamenperiode een eerste belangrijke meting. En dat kan twee kanten op gaan. Allereerst studenten die een acht of een hoger halen. Deze studenten vallen op. Dat zijn talenten, studenten die boven het maaiveld willen uitsteken. Misschien wel onze toekomstige onderstudenten. Maar ook de andere kant. De studenten die een onvoldoende hebben behaald. Komt dat omdat ze niet hard genoeg gewerkt hebben? Of dat ze misschien erg moeten wennen aan het andere systeem van leren? Gelukkig is er voor hen nog geen man overboord. Er is gelegenheid om het vak dit jaar nog één keer te herkansen. Maar dan moeten ze hem ook wel pakken. Kern van mijn verhaal vanavond is... hoe kunnen uw zoon of dochter en wij en u als ouder... er in gezamenlijkheid voor zorgen... dat we elkaar in 2019 weer zien bij de diploma-uitreiking. Allereerst moet u weten dat het studeren aan een hogeschool heel anders is dan het leren op de middelbare school. In principe is de student zelf verantwoordelijk voor zijn studiesucces. En dat betekent dat de student zelf zijn studie plant en organiseert. En dat is wennen. Sommigen pakken dat zo op en anderen hebben gewoon wat langer tijd nodig. En daarom is er vanuit de opleiding veel begeleiding en sturing... Met name in het eerste jaar. Iedere klas heeft een studieloopbaanbegeleider of een mentor waar uw zoon of dochter steeds terecht kan met allerlei vragen. 
En de studieloopbaanbegeleider praat ook regelmatig met uw kind over zijn of haar studievoortgang. Zeker als straks na het eerste blok er niet goed is gescoord. Een ander verschil met de middelbare school is dat de hoeveelheid lesstof die er voor een tentamen moet worden geleerd veel groter is. De praktijk leert dan ook dat als een student niet direct begint met studeren, aan het begin van een blok, en we hebben vier blokken in een jaar, de kans groot is dat hij zijn tentamen niet haalt. En wij doen er alles aan om de studenten dat besef bij te brengen. Nog een verschil met de middelbare school is, is dat u, uw kind hier wordt opgeleid voor een beroep. En daar hoort professioneel gedrag bij. We spreken hen dan daar ook op aan. Op tijd komen moet je later ook in je werk. Ook samenwerken en plannen. Feedback kunnen geven en ontvangen en professioneel met elkaar en met de faciliteiten omgaan. Wat u ook moet weten is dat een student hier gedurende zijn studie, en die duurt vier jaar, heel veel keuzes moet maken. En dat begint zeker ook al in het eerste jaar. Misschien, misschien heeft u er nu al mee te maken dat uw zoon of dochter hardop tegen u zegt, pap, mam, ik ben er eigenlijk niet meer zo zeker van of de opleiding wel bij mij past. Stoppen, iets anders gaan doen, of dat uw kind rond de kerst van zijn SLB'er het advies krijgt om te stoppen met de studie, omdat wij er dan al niet meer in geloven dat hij voldoende studiepunten haalt in het eerste jaar, of dat de inzetmotivatie veel en veel te laag is. En deze dingen gebeuren. En horen bij 17, 18-jarigen die nog volop vaak aan het zoeken zijn en midden in hun ontwikkeling staan. Of gewoon het nieuwe studentenleven in de stad Groningen veel te leuk vinden. En ook dat moet. En daarom stopt ook ieder jaar, en schrik niet, ongeveer 25% van de studenten in het eerste jaar. Wat we er ook aan doen. En dat geldt voor alle opleidingen binnen de Hanse Hogeschool en landelijk ligt dat percentage veel hoger. En wij zeggen dan, ga thuis serieus het gesprek aan als het echt niet gaat en laat je dan uitschrijven van de opleiding en ga iets doen de rest van het jaar wat je wel leuk vindt. Maar het kan ook zijn, en dat gebeurt gelukkig in de meeste gevallen... Dat uw kind zegt, ik vind het hartstikke leuk op mijn opleiding. Ik vind het een mooi beroep. En sterker nog, de behoefte heeft om in die vier jaar niet alleen te studeren, maar ook andere belangrijke ervaringen op te doen. En voor die studenten zijn er heel veel kansen om het allerbeste uit zichzelf te halen. Zijn talenten optimaal te ontplooien, zelfs uit te willen blinken. En wij zouden dan ook graag zien dat u die ambitie stimuleert. Zo kan uw zoon of dochter geselecteerd worden voor het Hanse Honders College. Of dat hij studentassistent wordt. Of in het bestuur gaat zitten voor onze studieverenigingen Kick, Glitch of Realtime. Of deel gaat uitmaken van de medezeggenschap. Of heel hoge cijfers haalt en voor cum laude gaat. En bij het maken van al die keuzes spelen wij natuurlijk een belangrijke rol, maar ook uw rol is ontzettend belangrijk. Betrokkenheid en klankbord gesprekspartner zijn van uw zoon of dochter, met name ook in dat eerste jaar. Tot slot. Wij nemen u vanavond mee in de nieuwe wereld van uw kind. Een wereld die opleidt voor een beroep in de communicatie, in de ICT... In de mediasector of in de creatieve industrie. Waarbij uw zoon of dochter begeleid wordt door docenten, vakmensen die heel vaak zelf het beroep in de praktijk nog uitoefenen. En dan nu nog praktisch. U heeft allemaal thuis een programma toegestuurd gekregen, een groepsindeling. En hierop kunt u lezen in welke groep u bent ingedeeld en in welk lokaal. 
u straks verwacht wordt voor een proefcollege of voorlichting. En Selma vertelt u zo dadelijk met wie van de studenten, eerstejaars, tweedejaars studenten, die ook boven het maaiveld willen uitsteken, mee kunt lopen. Alvast een applaus voor deze studenten. Ik wens u allen een leuke en leerzame avond toe en ik zie u graag weer in de afloop als we een drankje en een hapje voor u klaar hebben staan. Um, geniet ervan en uh, Selma neem jij het van mij over en ik dank u wel en fijn dat u er allemaal bent. Oké, okay, my name is Henriette Eilander. I'm the program manager and that means that I'm mainly responsible for the whole of the program uh, of communication and multimedia design of which... Um, uh, the major game design and development is one of the three programs. And my name is uh, Ilko Braat. I'm the senior lecturer who is responsible for that major game design and development. So, uh, yeah, we will together do the first presentation. And we will try to give you an overview of what it is really like to study here in first year. Of course, you've heard a lot of stories, I, I hope, I assume, from your son of da uh, or daughter. But uh, we want to tell you what the official version is of um, uh, what we're doing here. And of course, there will be plenty of time for you to ask us questions about the program or to ask our students questions, uh, because that's what we're here for, to give you as much an overview of what we're doing here, what the program actually entails, and of course, all, uh, to answer all your questions or your son or daughter's questions about what you run into in this program. As I said before, we have three uh, majors within communication and multimedia design. And the three majors are game design and development. That's the international program. About 25% of our students is uh, non-Dutch by origin, um, which is a thing that we um, uh, foster very much because it gives the international flavor to our program. And that makes it a completely different game program than you see elsewhere in uh, the Netherlands. Next to that, we have two other streams. That's Interactive Media and Technology, which is a Dutch uh, taught program, so completely in Dutch. Of course, there's English involved, and of course, there are also international opportunities there, but it is basically a Dutch pro dot pro uh, taught program. And we have Media Concepting and Design. So um, those are the three majors, but of course, um, we have chosen here in Groningen to make sure that all students can work in their major from the start. That means that we divide it um, from the introduction on the students into the groups that belong to their majors and that they also have very major specific uh, programs and, and uh, subjects. Earlier I got some comments from uh, some parents who were saying, yeah, my son, he just, he's just playing games. How, how is that a study? Um, it is not. I mean, we do play games, but for a purpose. Um, and some of you uh, I have talked to at the various open days and different moments, and I've tried to explain well, how that works as well. So I hope you have some kind of image. But I wanted to convey that one of the first things we try to uh, teach our students to, to get them into is that it's not so much about the game itself. Sure, we learn them how to program a computer and how to draw and how to, uh, um, how to think about what, what, is it, what makes a good game. But one of the most important things is to start thinking beyond the game. What do you want to do with it? And that can be many things. For example, on the left side, we are testing a game with some of the kids, some, some uh, younger kids here, and that's just an entertainment game. We tried to make a game that appeals to kids, and apparently at this event they came up to us and they wanted to play the game, so we kind of succeeded there. So instead of thinking about how do I create this game, these students succeeded in uh, creating something that appealed to these children and made them happy in certain ways. And that's uh, more important than just how good can you program or how good can you draw. The other thing that I depicted here uh, this is a, a hospital bed, uh, is that you can do different things with games. So instead of just thinking, okay, I'm going to make a game, we also try to make what we call serious games. A game that helps to make the world a small, uh, a little bit better place. For example, by preparing children to be more quiet before they have to go to surgery. By explaining them how that works through uh, a series of games that they can play in their hospital bed 
on an iPad. So again, here, it's not so much about how does that game work technically, but what do you want it to achieve with the players in the end? And once you define that, sure, then we can talk about, okay, and then what skills and what kind of things do you need to get there? So, what do you need to get there? Um, if you look uh, on job websites, online, or maybe even in the papers, uh, and you do that a, a lot of times, you might find a number of jobs that are related to games, or that are actually in what we call the games industry. However, it's a really young industry. So, unlike maybe more established industries, there's not a standard way of naming all the different jobs. We listed all the jobs uh, for a couple of years, and we found 300 different titles that people have. It could be level designer, it could be tools FX designer, it could be a game programmer slash tool uh, developer, basically anything. What we did is categorize that into three main roles um, in, by talking to different companies how they look at it. And then we chose to group it into designer, somebody who thinks about what would be a good idea for this particular game, the game artist, somebody who can draw, who can define the visual style of the game and create the 2D or 3D parts uh, of that experience, and a game developer, somebody who's more inclined to the technical side of things, who can write the scripts or the programs uh, um, to make the game actually uh, function as a whole. So that's like a, a simplification of what's really out there. Um, then what is the job perspective? Because there uh, is a new recent study about jobs in the, in the uh, creative industry. And it's good to know that, sure, there is jobs. We focus on the international job market, and there's a lot going on right there. Also in the Netherlands, there's a bit of growth. We went from 300 to 400 companies in the last two years. So there is a bit of growth in the games industry. However, there's also a lot of people that are interested in doing something in the games industry. So the competition is quite fierce and you need to work on your portfolio, uh, um, the, the games that you created before this, um, during your study and also next to your study. So you really need to want this to, to make it to the end. Um, jobs that you can think of within the games industry, within the larger creative industry, or even within ICT or media or more general jobs are things like developer, game developer, artist, game artist, sometimes even a lead artist or a, a project manager, scrum master are things that, that are taught here. Uh, or perhaps you want to be an entrepreneur and start your own company. Those are all options. <coughs> then it's hard to predict because we've just started this study in last September and uh, best case you will finish in 2019 as our dean just explained. Um, if you look that far ahead, it's really hard to tell what a job will be like. The world, especially the international world of creativity and media, is changing so fast that it's really hard to exactly pinpoint what the next jobs will be. And talking to different professionals in this field, outside this field, uh, we came to the conclusion that you need uh, uh, an additional perspective to make sure that you are able to function in, uh, um, in those jobs in four years. And therefore, next to, to just games, and just game design, and just game art, and just game programming, we added four uh, learning lines, as we call them. And one I already explained, it's, it's shown here as user experience, but I started out by trying to explain that we're not just focusing on the game, but on the kind of experience it offers to the people that play them. The second learning line that we have is called 21st century skills. And it's about those skills uh, that you need to survive in the 21st century. For example, you need to be much more aware about cultural differences between people or what's going on globally. You can't see that apart uh, from just the Netherlands. Um, we strongly believe that you should not just think of games or media from um, a fun-based perspective only. You need some kind of research to seek out how it works, why it works like that, and also be able to test that with different players. So we uh, are developing what we call design-based research. 
And as I already mentioned, you need to be creative. You need to be able to think of new things and possibly be able to start your own company or at least uh, be somebody who's proactive. And therefore, we also pay attention to innovation and entrepreneurship. So next to the gaming projects, these things are woven uh, through this study. So what does the study exactly look like? Um, Tiny uh, already asked you, do you know when the exact exams are and when are they? Um, I'm not going to go into that detail, but it might be good to have some kind of overview. So vertically here we see the four years that a study takes. And horizontally it's the, the 40 weeks uh, of classes, uh, exams, uh, projects that go throughout the year. So currently your son or daughter is about here and we need to go all the way to here. And this is how we do it. As you can see, the first two years are very much organized into themes, in, into blocks. For example, the first period is called game design, or more specifically, it's called game design and concept art. And that's about designing games. I will go into uh, detail a bit later. But it's, it's much more about the general idea than all the specific skills. Second part, is more into game development. We will start to learn programming. Uh, we will start to learn developing digital art using the, the various tools that we use. Then the, the rest of the first year, it becomes even more complicated because here we start looking at what we call serious games. So next to the game just being fun, we're also trying to make a game that uh, uh, solves a certain problem or learns a person something. So that's quite a big challenge. The difficulty increases quite rapidly from here to here. However, if you manage to uh, do all that, to keep up with that tempo and finish your first year, that's an excellent preparation because you've seen all the different roles of programming, design and art, and you've seen the two different contexts, something for just entertainment and something serious, something to achieve something else. In the second year, we are thus able to be much more specific and we will go into things like virtual reality. Our second year students, as they, well, they will discuss some of that later on, um, are building virtual reality applications for the Oculus Rift and different other new devices in ten, just 10 weeks. Um, here in Game Lab, you get the opportunity for the first time to spend 20 weeks on your own project. We will help you to build your portfolio, do something that you are interested in. And the third and fourth year, it's far away now, but it's very much about self-deployment. Uh, self For example, you will need to do an internship with a game company, uh, possibly in the Netherlands, uh, hopefully and possibly abroad. We have a, a broad network of different companies and places where you can take an internship. However, you need to start looking for one that suits you. So this might also be something to discuss together at home. What would be an interesting country? what would be an interesting opportunity that adds to what you're trying to do. Same thing for what we call a minor or an elective. And in the fourth year, we ask you to graduate, of course, which you will do by doing a larger research project, which is your thesis or graduation project. But that's really far away. So as my last part, what's actually in such a period? Well. A couple of weeks ago, we started with a kickoff. And this is like a large happening where the period coordinator, which is one of my teachers, uh, explains what the purpose of the coming 10 weeks is, what we are going to do, what the different courses are, um, and what books you need, what you need to do, and how that is planned throughout the period. So we always start out with a short introduction of what will actually happen. Then throughout such a period, you will have a couple of different courses. Um, and I've listed them here vertically so you can see how it is organized. Almost every 10 weeks will uh, feature a project. And usually that's like the main thing or the, 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 the thing that all the other courses tie into. For example, the project in the first 10 weeks, um, I don't know, did you talk about this at home with your parents? Does everybody know what, what they need to do? Can somebody explain? I can try. Okay, please. 
put it by loads of seats, it's not her fault. <laughs> yeah. um, what she's doing now, she's uh, 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 busy with concept art. Uh, she's making different layers in her sketches and in her art, so that she can build up. Uh, before that, she had to, she has to think about a character, uh, and she has uh, the features of her character. She had to think about it afterwards. She had she had to, uh, drawn it, and uh, well, she put it in, and it has to be um, uh, it has to be uh, it has to fulfill some special features, and she's busy with that. And what's most important, I think, she has to write down how she did it. Okay. So that's right. okay, thank you for adding that. Um, that's a really good example. It ties into one of the courses right here, and it ties into the project. No, you, you don't have to check. This is, this is, this is right. The project itself, um, we, we started out with uh, uh, something that everybody can do. You don't need to, to be able to program anything. It's not a technical thing. We asked them to create a card game that people like to play. Everybody can take a piece of paper, cut some cards, uh, write on it what they do, and start playing. So it's a very low barrier to start creating a game. However, you do need to start thinking about how those cards work together. What do they look like? So what is actually the game design here? So the project is literally quite simple, but brings out a lot of questions about games. Here are two core courses. One is called Game Design, and this is about how do you create a game that actually works? What are good rule sets for games? How do you score points? Um, how is a player rewarded for what they do in the game? So this is the introduction to how does a game work? Here's a course called Concept Art, and uh, you explained it quite, quite well, where we ask people not to just begin practicing drawing, but we ask them to think about what they want that drawing to do or to mean. And exactly as you said, we also asked them later on to look back on how did you actually achieve that and did it work? So these are two important steps in most of our courses. Um, I'll finish up with the last two courses. We have Thinking Outside the Box. Um, this is uh, mostly to bring together our Dutch students and our international students um, to have a look at, hey, who am I really? What am I doing here? And what is the context that I am in now to kind of make the transition to a different field, an international field of game design? There's also a, a training in English in there, and there are a number of creativity techniques uh, called design thinking. And the last part I want to finish with that is from the very first day, we want to give an impression of the things that you can do in the future. So we organized a series that's called Meet Your Future where we invite people from the field um, to talk about what their job is. And there have been different examples. Uh, we have had people that are game designers. We have had before people that are programmers. And just uh, um, last Monday, yesterday, um, my former colleague at Grendel Games was here to explain how he builds different serious games and how he makes money with that. So it's interesting to see that from the first day you get an impression of things that you could do, which helps you hopefully to orient on where you want to be in four years. And why do we do that in the first year? Because if you start thinking about it now, what you want to be and what you want to do, you can still make choices in your study on how to do that. So it's important to start with that straight away. Well, that's a really quick overview of what a period of 10 weeks uh, might look like. Thank you. Um, and that's the, uh, the, the, the content side. Um, but of course, since it is the first year, and as uh, Trani Faber already explained, it's a big gap between secondary school and here. It is rather different. I think you've guessed that by now. Uh, and it means that we really um, uh, want to help out. We really want to support our students in bridging the gap and making sure that they feel at home here, that they feel at ease here, that they feel ready to study, but that they also understand that it's not secondary school anymore. Not that there's anything wrong with secondary school, but this is where they chose for. If this is your choice, if you really want to be here, 
um, participate, be active, um, um, and engage in our community because we think that is a very important key element to making sure that your projects work, to make sure that you are um, a success and that you can make it in this business because it is rather competitive and yeah, in the end um, uh, a company will be interested in you, in what you have to show for yourself. What did you do during your uh, courses? What did you make? What did you, um, what, what do you have to show for yourself? Because especially if you're in, in this business, it's very important that you have a portfolio that really shows what you can do. Um, but we have a lot of uh, support systems in place to make sure that we help you bridge the gap, especially in your first year. Um, of course, we have teaching staff uh, like um, uh, Dao, who's just outside, like uh, Ayan, uh, like Eoko, and many, many others. Um, people who have worked in the, in, uh, in the game industry or are still involved in projects there, who've done research in uh, that direction, uh, and who are really committed to working here uh, with our students. That's one, that was the obvious one. Next to that we have academic counselors. That's also a staff member with a specific task to be, in that you call it a mentor, um, to be really assigned to a class. Every class in first year has its own mentor and that's someone um, that really pays attention to the progress, to the study progress and the uh, enthusiasm of a class. Get back to that in a minute. Educational support, of course we also have support systems that can help with all sorts of questions about enrollment, about exams, about uh, where to go to, um, because it's also a very big campus, eh? it's called the uh, Zeneca Complex and the word complex pretty much covers it uh, for most first year students. Um, we have a lot of uh, people who are um, simply there to support the students and answer questions. Program managers, yeah, that's the like of like of me uh, that help um, uh, shape a program and help uh, organize schedules and exam thingies and uh, all sorts of interesting things that also needs to be done. But I'm also there to uh, keep an eye out for uh, how we go about improving our quality because, of course, uh, we evaluate our program at very regular intervals with the aim of um, making our program better. And together with the teaching staff, we sit together with our students. Uh, thinking about how did the blog go, what did you experience and what do you think we should ex um, uh, explain better in the future or change or add or what do you particularly like, what do you want us to keep or invest in more. Um, we really benefit from, from those sessions. The dean of the school, well, you already met her, uh, Miss Trini Faber. She is, well, um, I don't know if it's very good if you as a first year student get very much to do with our dean. <laughs> Maybe that's not a good sign, <laughs> um, but you can understand that one. The exam board. We have an official exam board that keeps an eye out on whether we maintain the rules and whether we treat every student exactly the same, which is, of course, very important if you're a big um, uh, training program, but also because what we do here is, of course, giving out diplomas that have to have a certain um, um, societal value. And, of course, we need to um, uphold our, uh, our own regulations. The exam board is there to look out for it. So if, for instance, uh, a student gets a, a grade, a failing grade, and has no idea why there's a fail uh, uh, there, he or she can go to the teacher and, of course, the teacher will explain and if the student then still is not satisfied because he thinks that there was something wrong in whatever, uh, he can go to the exam board. And the exam board is an uh, um, independent body that will look then into the case and see if there are changes needed and if uh, the student's right or the teacher in this case is right. So that's a very official body that really checks whether the teachers and students um, get what um, they promised each other. We have several other committees also involved, have, for instance, uh, an assessment committee that really looks at the assessments, whether that is fair, whether uh, students are treated uh, well, whether the design is good. So there are a lot of committees keeping an eye out on, uh, on the quality of our program, but also helping students um, to improve this program, but also to get your, yeah, your money's worth. There's also another side to the first year. Um, by law, in the Netherlands, um, we do not select at the gate. 
Uh, some of the research universities can do that, but in higher education, we're not allowed to do that. So if you have a, a have a diploma with the right profile, or you have the right um, um, uh, uh, any other diploma, and you can enter this program, we're not allowed to say, oh, we don't want you because you're whatever. We uh, have to take in everyone because the Dutch law says um, in the Netherlands everybody can enter a, sec an, uh, 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 a program of higher education, but in the first year the program will have to select students. And we do not select at the gate because you don't know what game design really is. So in the first year we are going to find out whether you fit this program and whether this program fits you. And so uh, that's why we have classes like Meet Your F Future, and so that you can find out whether this profession is really the line of work that you would like to start in uh, when you get your first job. But on the other hand, we also want to find out whether you fit to the program. And that's the, the tricky part. Every block in the first year, there are four blocks, has 15 credits. So 60 in total. 60 per year, so also 60 in the first year. In order to continue after one year of study, you need to have obtained at least 48 credits from the 60, um, so before the 1st of September 2016. So in one full year of study, you need to have obtained four-fifths of, uh, uh, of the uh, uh, total amount of credits, 48 credits out of the 60. And of course, uh, if you're well and healthy and you didn't have any big problems, because of course, we wouldn't ask that from someone who was ill uh, for two months or had big problems or whatever. But a reasonably sound person should be able to show us that he or she can obtain at least 48 credits out of the 60 in one year. Because otherwise, it would mean that you would drag along a long time before you get your diploma. So that's the selection. If you have less credits than the 48 and you haven't been ill or there is nothing, um, hey, you didn't have any big uh, disturbances or family problems or whatever that kept you from studying the best you could, uh, you receive a negative binding study advice. It's called an advice, but that's the wrong word actually, because it is binding. So you really have to go. <laughs> um, uh, and that's of course um, uh, not very nice, but you have a lot of, you have for every assignment that you do in the first year, or every exam that you take, you have at least two opportunities. So that helps. Um, sometimes students know that they have made a wrong start. Um, as Trani already said, or Dean, uh, the dropout rate in general is about 25%. Those are not students who are incapable of getting a diploma in higher education. They just drop out. But it's something completely different. Those two are not necessarily related. Because a lot of students drop out because they make the wrong start in uh, the first year. And because of the fact that the gap between secondary school and higher education is rather big. And you're all independent. Um, sometimes students uh, live for the first time alone, uh, have, uh, uh, understand or uh, find their way in the interesting city of Groningen. Those temptations can also take up a lot of your energy when you start out in your program. So some students realize very early that they've made the wrong decision or that the program is just not what they thought it would be. That's also something that happens. Then it is very um, um, important to know that you can, if you stop before the 1st of February, you will not, not get a negative binding study advice. And there are also some uh, regulations around the Dutch study financing uh, system. Even though there is no study financing anymore, but there are still the OVA-kaart and all sorts of other regulations. Um, so then it's important to stop before the 1st of February to avoid um, negative binding study advice. Because it, once you get a negative binding study advice, you cannot return to this program anymore in two years. Any questions about this one? By law, it's for all programs in the Hans Hogeschool and nearly all uh, higher education programs in the Netherlands have a system like that. And it's just motivated because of the Dutch law that we don't want to select people at 17 um, for the rest of their lives. But they want, that we want in Dutch society, we want to give young people the opportunity to 
experience a year what it is like, what they chose, and whether it's really the way that they want to proceed. Most people who quit uh, in their first year or get a negative binding study advice end up in the end with a diploma of higher education, just not the one that they first picked. And so, can be difficult to start. Okay, Ilko already gave you an uh, overview of uh, the main phase. Uh, I'd like to add something extra about year three, because it seems like a long time away, but it's not that far away. And especially if you have very enterprising ideas about going abroad, it is handy that you start um, uh, planning ahead. Um, the program has a lot of um, parts that are completely identical for every student. But there are also a lot of parts where you can really shape the program towards your own uh, aspirations and your own interests. And especially the placement is very important in that direction because it's the first time that you really encounter what it is like for real, so to say. <laughs> The students always think that what we are doing is not really real. <laughs> Even though we have real uh, companies involved, once they go on placement, they think this is really what it's like. Um, so the placement is very important, um, but also the minor uh, semester. There is a semester of choice also in the third year one semester that you can also go to partner schools. We have a few partner schools already. We're still working on enlarging that network of having interesting uh, game-related partner schools uh, in, the, in, in Europe um, that and, uh, are um, great places to meet new people and new interesting theory about game, uh, game design, game development, um, just not here in the Netherlands. And it might add a lot to your personal development, because going abroad is, of course, a very nice way uh, to broaden your horizon, literally. But also, uh, once you go apply for a job and they ask you, well, are you a very independent person? It is always nice if you can say for yourself that you survived half a year in uh, Shanghai on your own, uh, doing a placement. I mean, that would really turn some heads, I can imagine. Um, but you can also stay in the Netherlands. Nothing wrong with the Netherlands, of course. And the Netherlands is, of course, uh, has a very big creative industry, so is also an interesting option. We do find placements for our students, but we um, especially uh, stimulate students to find their own placements. Because uh, our experience, students always have a broader network than we can ever organize. Year four has specialization and graduation project, and especially the graduation is very important because it is the, the way to really shape your own portfolio, um, make sure that you understand what you want, what kind of jobs you would like and what would fit you, and, and how you can explain that. Important document. Uh, as I said before, um, as a student you need to do a lot of stuff, but there are also a lot of uh, rules to protect students and uh, to protect them against us, I guess. Um, uh, teaching and examining regulations. That's how the document is called. It is, of course, a very legal and very boring document, but it's very important that you know that it's there because once you feel that there is some injustice because you didn't know that the deadline was changed or whatever, it is very important that you know where to find it. If you can't find it, ask your academic counselor um, because it is... Um, we think it's very important that every student gets treated the same and that the rules are absolutely clear about when do you get what sort of uh, grade, for instance, and how do you graduate and what does it need, what do you need to do? Because you need to do a lot of things, but there are also a lot of rights that students have. Academic counseling, I said that I would come back to that one, um, or mentoring as it's called in Dutch, mentor. We have five first-year classes, and these are the, uh, the consecutive um, uh, academic counselors. Ian is uh, there in the left-hand corner. He is the academic counselor of 1A. Thomas Mo couldn't make it tonight. He's from 1B. Then we have Jonathan, uh, who is also our study advisor, from 1C. Dawa is over there from 1D. 
And last but not least, we have Ilya from uh, 1F. Those are the academic counselors, and uh, they are very much concerned with uh, the first year students. They are a staff member that um, really is there to talk to for our first year students. So it is also the staff member that will stay their academic counselor for their whole of their studies, as long as it takes. <laughs> But at least four years, the academic counselor will try to help the student because, of course, after the first year, you really know your academic counselor and he or she knows you. Oh, they're all men. He knows you. Uh, so, um, yeah, that really helps. Even later on in your studies when you wonder about, well, should I go abroad? Should I stay in the Netherlands? Which placement would suit me? Those are the kind of questions that also interest um, your academic counselor. He helps students to make the right choices and he knows a lot about our support system. He knows where you can get extra help. He knows where you can get extra advice. So it's a very important um, key factor in, in helping your son or daughter making this study a success. He also discusses study progress, of course, because that is also something to keep an eye out. He is the one that is involved in Meet Your Future, eh? the, the program, the line that we have throughout to uh, help you get an idea of what it is like to progress with the study and then start working. What are the kind of jobs that I would qualify for? What can I do? What is the out there? At least four individual meetings uh, between the academic counselor and, uh, and an individual student. But uh, I said at least because sometimes students run into problems or have personal problems or whatever. So uh, that can always make a difference, of course. Class meetings, yeah, there are also things that uh, an academic counselor discusses with the whole class, things that are relevant for all students or changes. And there are also certain assignments in the program that a student has to do that are uh, handed in to their academic counselor because they really are about who am I, what am I doing here and what would I like to learn here. So a very important key person. Next to that, we also have study counselors, or in Dutch, decanen. Those are the ones that are really specifically trained to help students who are in a jam, who really have personal problems or have problems with um, um, uh, dyslexia or uh, other handicaps or who are uh, 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 very involved in sports, for instance, top sporters or um, any other challenges that you might have. Those are very specialized people, also have uh, a backup system of um, psychologists, um, uh, even uh, medics that can help students uh, if they're really in that kind of uh, specific situations. Because, of course, we hope that everything goes well, but you never know. Hey, you can fall ill uh, and miss out on very important deadlines, uh, and that shouldn't be the end of your uh, career here. Definitely not. So these people can help you, and more specialized, of course, than our own staff members. We have a study advisor, someone that is really specializes in, in helping students who do not know if this is the right program for them. Uh, and we have language support uh, in Dutch and in the English because it's called still in Dutch the taalgarage because they're just making the leap towards uh, also supporting uh, the English stream. Um, they are there for students who find it very difficult to get their thoughts onto paper in a structured way and they help one-on-one -on -one students to, um, to improve their writing skills, for instance. And then after the first year, for the ones who feel that they can even handle more than what we have to offer in the first year, we also have an honors talent program. That's for the very motivated students who really feel that they want even more challenges. Um, they can apply for um, uh, an extra program. And it means 30 credits extra on top of your regular program starting in year two. So instead of doing year two, three and four, which means three times 60 credits, you add an extra 30 credits of, uh, of interesting. Um, I mean, we have one honor student in the room. <laughs> so if you have questions, you can ask her. She's in the, in the back. 
um, uh, about this program. We have a very, very enthusiastic study association of which we are very proud. They're called Glitch. Ah, oh, they're both from Glitch. Um, uh, and uh, they also uh, help um, stimulate the sense of community that we have as a, as a game design and development. And uh, um, they really help us in uh, promoting our, um, our program. Uh, we have a PR and promotion team, and uh, that's also very important. Yeah, you're also part of that. We knew that one. <laughs> Otherwise, you wouldn't wear orange. Um, and we have a lot of committees that we also ask students to participate in, like, for instance, the Medezegenschapsraad, a very Dutch thing. But our participation council also has student members, of course, because we think it's very important that students also understand that that is also a part of working life and that they have influence on how we organize things and how we go about guaranteeing our quality. And then, yeah, July 2019, that's when we meet each other again. Hopefully not in this venue, but in uh, something like the Martini Plaza or a fancy church or something. Uh, and then uh, we will have a, a nice graduation ceremony to celebrate uh, another um, shift of students that uh, is ready to go into working life. Any questions so far? You can also ask them in Dutch if, if English is a handicap. But you can also ask them later. Shall we ask them later? Okay, then we now go over to the second part. <coughs> Yeah, because of course games are an interactive thing. I mean, players play them, they press buttons or they move stuff around and then uh, things react. So none of us are very comfortable with a presentation that is just only sending. So from now on, uh, we're going to be a bit more interactive. And we require you, not only the students, but also the parents, to start doing things. The first thing you need to do is to assess or have a look at what kind of chair am I on. <laughs> and there are two options. Either your chair has armrests or it hasn't. So check for yourself quietly what kind of chair am I in. And then remember that choice. Because it will be important later on. So keep that in mind. Can you guys come? Um, well, next to the three functions that uh, Jessica and Robin uh, are fulfilling that are already on the sheet, uh, they are also, of course, our students. And one of the first ways we would like to introduce you to the things that we do is to have our students talk about that. I mean, we can explain how it should work, but they know how it actually works uh, when it is happening. So these guys started out last September, uh, helped us build the program to what it is now, for the first time, uh, and they also did a lot of good uh, 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 games in that time. And I've asked them to share with you some of the things that they did. Okay, so games. Well, you probably have your son or daughter who plays a lot of games, and but it's not only for playing games, it's actually for analyzing what do other games do, and also for researching finding new references to, okay, this is kind of interesting, maybe I can do something with it. But the first time you get here, you're like, okay, how do I even make a game? I know how to play them, but how do I make them? So you start with card games. And this is an example of one of the card games that was made. It's an element-based card game. You play it with five people, and you also apply energy to it. Sounds very simple, but it was very hard to make. <laughs> Because you also have different dice, and that way there are a lot of different card games. So you can always ask when you get home, dear, dear child, what kind of card game do you make? Um, but next to that, you come to the second period, and that's when you start programming. The teachers call it the big, the big winter wall, uh, because you've probably never, ever, ever seen a code before. Uh, this is a game that everyone starts with, because everyone learns a little bit of program, and it's called Pong. Very, very simple <laughs> in looks, but actually very, very, very hard to make and very difficult. Um, after that, you'll, uh, next day you also have a project in there and you will be making a digital card game or at least a card game, 
uh, a digital game that involves cards. This is one that's made by, uh, well, by our years, and it's a military sort of game where you have to destroy the other side by placing cards with units on it. It's and it also took us a lot of time to actually balance it, okay, how does it work, and is it even fun? I mean, you can, all the other games are made for, for years or even months, and it's like, how, how do you make a game fun? Um, and now I'll give the word to my dearest colleague to explain you the rest of the year. Yeah. So this is a serious game that uh, people made for the KGRW, a organization that uh, tries to help children that have issues at home actually uh, come talk to those people because uh, an issue they had with the fact that children weren't actually uh, motivated to go to them and ask for help. And the assignment that the uh, organization came to us with, Bake is a game that actually helps motivate these children to come to us. And uh, this is a little quiz that uh, they made, actually explaining how the KGRW works and how uh, coming to them actually helps a lot. But uh, outside of school, there are some other things that also are uh, organized within the industry themselves. Uh, after January, there's a global game jam here in Leeuwarden uh, that org that's, uh, where, where people can sign up and have 48 hours to create a game. Uh, several of our students from the from, uh, current second year uh, signed up last year and made this game scrambled. Um, the theme was what now, so what do we do now? And they came up with this story about a few hamsters that were, uh, trans uh, were traversing this planet and suddenly they got stuck. So what now? Um, and this ties in to what we do as Glitch, because as Glitch, we pr try to provide even more than the studies does. Uh, we are, uh, organize social events to uh, get the community tighter together. We organize uh, entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial things, such as uh, events to first look, control con, gamescom, events for developers where they can share the talents and uh, share their uh, own knowledge uh, for students to go there and, well, make themselves uh, fame, uh, well, well known. And lastly, we're also working on the study side. We're providing extra lessons that, uh, the, sco that uh, the school themselves uh, either have planned for a later period or they need, just need some extra work on. Recently, we did an extra Photoshop class where we helped students uh, more f uh, providing more in functionality of Photoshop. And uh, that was very uh, helpful. And this is from the second year on the side. Uh, this is level design that we're working on. So on the online virtual reality, we're also creating worlds, 3D. So from one year, you quickly jump from very simple things to very big things. Uh, coming back to Glitch, though, um, we are just a very small team. We started this out last year in the fourth period. So we're still very early, but we've got a lot of stuff done during the holiday. So right now, we're just throwing ourselves right at it and uh, finding as much as we can for the new students. Well, after this, we'll be sitting in the back with two of our laptops. You can always, uh, well, after the workshop, you can go to us, uh, maybe pl even play some of the games. And we also have some results of the Photoshop session, the workshop that we did. We can show you what do we teach there. And some of the artists from the first years. So you're welcome, welcome to join us there in the end of the workshop. And now I give the word to you. Unless, unless there are parents that want to ask yes. oh, right. students from the last year, yes. <laughs> what is going on? What was unclear? What's even more interesting? But you also can do that later on. They will be here in this room. And of course, it's really cool to check out the games because they only briefly let them skip by, but. They're actually full, completed games that you can play. And they are games like the things that your sons and daughters will be developing this year. So already in one year, they developed two or three uh, different games for their portfolio. So that's pretty cool. Um, the last remainder of this evening, we want to see you guys work. So we've been working quite hard to uh, uh, give you an impression. Um, but the best way to get an idea of what we're doing here is to actually experience it. So we prepared a little workshop, and we want to see how good your parents are at game design. So if I can ask my colleague Arjan to come forward, and he will also explain uh, why you needed to look at your chair. I'm one of the academic counselors uh, for 1A, and uh, the students from the other classes know me as a teacher. 
I give the game design workshop and project coaching on the card game they design. And we like to do with you one of the exercises we did during the um, game design workshop. And that is the one about mini pawn. So the, your uh, sons and daughters will know which exercise that is. And I want to ask all the students to uh, help out with uh, coordinating and explaining what the rules are for the game when the, your parents um, have trouble remembering it. And you can observe, of course, and give suggestions. So, we don't have a lot of time for this, but we're going to make you a game designer today. Uh, and for the parents at home not being here present, they might do this exercise with their children some other time. Um, it's a very simple game, and we're going to see how we can develop it to a good game. Because making a game is easy, but making a good game is hard. Um, this is the game th that you start with. This is the setup that starts. And we're just going to give you paper, pencils, components, and it's up to you to make the game. That's called prototyping. It won't be pretty, but it will be functional. The rules for the game are like this. You can move your pawn forward, like this. You can take a pawn from the opponent by moving diagonally. For people who play chess, they might remember this uh, as, as the simple pawns play. So, and the simple victory competition right now is to get one of your pawns to the other side. If you manage to do that, you win the game. However, the question is, is it a fun game and how could it be better? Um, we want to ask you to uh, play a few rounds, create the game, try it out, and then we're going to develop it. So, for the people who remember the chairs, they're on. The people from uh, the chairs without uh, armrest, thank you. Uh, we have some setup over there at the tables with uh, game design components, and I want to invite you to go over there to sit down and start with the game. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're now starting with the, um, with the workshop, and of course that's, for us, a big part of the fun, but for you a little bit difficult uh, to understand and to comprehend. So that's why we close up now for our international uh, watchers. We hope you have gotten at least an, some idea of what your son or daughter are doing here. <laughs> if you should you have any questions coming up from this presentation, please do not hesitate to ask your son or daughter for the email address of the academic counselor and please ask us these questions because we really value your uh, involvement with your daughter or your son's study and we find it very important that you have a clear view on what we're doing here because they're very important and you are very important to us. Thank you very much.